both have been patiently enduring our business meeting, um, but they are the, the main event, but the main event is being um, coordinated, put together by Cliff Grow, who's a, a member and past chair of Alaska Common Ground. Uh, Cliff has for four decades studied and advocated regarding how the state of Alaska collects, spends, and saves money. In 1982, Cliff was the legislative assistant who worked by far the most on the legislation. They created the permanent fund dividend. In 1989, he played a major role as special assistant to the commissioner of revenue in the successful effort to pass a major oil tax bill that raised revenues on net. In 2016, he designed and taught a course at the University of Alaska called Navigating Alaska's Fiscal and Economic Challenges. And in 2020, he produced and published three graphic guides to Alaska's fiscal crisis. In 2021, Cliff is helping to organize a statewide grassroots coalition calling for new revenues to address the state of Alaska's structural fiscal deficit. So Cliff, if you want to take it away and introduce our guest speakers. Thank you very much, um, Dick, uh, and um, really uh, appreciate this. Folks, um, I'm going to keep the introductions brief because uh, so that we can uh, uh, get into this uh, discussion. Um, we're, um, the, the second speaker today will be Representative um, Ivy Sponholtz, um, who has been a leader in fiscal discussions um, in our state legislature and is now um, this year uh, the chair of the uh, uh, Alaska House uh, State House's um, Ways and Means Committee, um, which has been holding hearings um, on Alaska's very substantial fiscal challenge, uh, or uh, we would say crisis now. Um, and um, our first speaker is uh, Senator Tom Begich, a uh, minority leader of the Alaska Senate. Um, and uh, uh, both of these um, legislators uh, are uh, Democrats uh, uh, who represent uh, districts in Anchorage. So we're going to start out in the format of this event. Well, Senator Begish will give a presentation of up to 10 minutes, presenting his own fiscal plan for our state, um, uh, looking forward. Um, then Richard Sponholtz will uh, do the same, present our own fiscal plan for uh, 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 for up to 10 minutes. Then the two legislators, Senator Sponholtz and, and Representative, Senator Begich and Representative Sponholtz will question each other, and then we'll have uh, questions from the audience. So Senator Begich, please give us our fiscal plan to save our state. Well, thank you for that uh, introduction, Cliff, and thank you, thank you for having me here and to the Board of Common Ground. I, I do want to tell you today is National Tell a Lie Day, and I'm going to do everything I can to avoid abiding by its uh, abiding by its parameters. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to lay out for you um, in four points with some sub points what are my essential elements of a plan. I'm going to talk to you about numbers associated with that plan and also illustrate some of the consideration that the Senate majority has given to uh, some of these similar elements. So you'll get a picture of both my sort of concepts and then the concepts that are coming out of the Senate majority. And so let me just jump right in by starting with um, revising the oil and gas structure or, pose, or posing new oil and gas revenue measures. The first element of my plan I've actually introduced to Senate Bill 13. It, which would raise, according to our legislative finance, a minimum of $228.5 million and a maximum of $272 million in revenue by adding 1% or 10 mils to the oil and gas property tax. This would have the benefit of not being based on the volatility of oil and gas prices and would capture revenue from additional property if there was additional development, et cetera. So it's sort of a, a tax that, that is more stable than basing a tax on oil and gas. Uh, of that money, 50% of it would be designated. We can't dedicate without a constitutional amendment. So designated to the capital income fund, 25% to the higher education investment fund, and 25% would be returned to communities that are using the senior or veterans property tax exemptions right now, sort of like a community dividend. And uh, those communities would be, are under statute, they're supposed to be paid back for that exemption. So this would actually go toward paying back that prior commitment. Now the uh, Senate has proposed uh, eliminating some of the per barrel tax credits uh, that are currently provided. And that they estimate about $200 million is what they would generate in revenue uh, from that proposal. So mine, 228.5 to 272. 
And the reason for that difference is depending on the year and the production tax, the production tax would be subtracted from the overall amount that that revenue would raise. The second thing comes from a constituent. I've been struggling with how we revise the dividend formula. I talked about this briefly with Cliff uh, on Thursday, but I want, came from a constituent of mine who described uh, a, a concept, a novel concept for setting up a sustainable dividend fund in the constitution. I wanna go through the numbers on that. So the second step is to revise the dividend formula. In this case, by calculating a new formula that would be based on what, what we would call the constitutional sustainable dividend fund. This fund would take the 6.3 billion from earning, it would take 6.3 billion from the earnings reserve that are the quote unpaid statutory dividends and they would be set aside in a constitutionally in a fund that would then produce a percent of market value that would be used to pay dividends in the future. The rest of the ERA would, uh, at the end of every fiscal year, would go to the CBR, would be transferred into the CBR every year. The uh, royalties would be changed. How we calculate royalties and where they come would be changed with 50% of royalties from oil and gas going to the corpus of the permanent fund itself, 25% to the corpus of this new constitutional dividend fund and 25% uh, to the actual expenditure of the dividend. So the dividend would be paid every year annually with 5% from the a uh, 5% uh, percent of market value from the sustainable dividend fund with the additional 25% from royalties combined. And then that would be divided by the population similar to as it's done now. The um, I'm drafting that legislation. It'll be introduced next week at the end of the week. So that's in the works right now. Um, so far for the last three years, we've received about a thousand dollar dividend check. This would lead to a slightly higher check but less than what we would under the current statute be required. Uh, it would probably require a transition period because it takes a couple of years to get to a constitutional amendment. So probably anywhere from two to three years of a thousand to $1,500 dividends that you would guarantee as part of the enabling legislation. And then um, as a separate bill, separate legislation. And then um, this would assume you're using 5% of the permanent funds percent of market value for funding state government. And now at a $70 billion permanent fund, that'd be about $3.5 billion. Uh, the, the, the Senate is talking about a new formula, but they haven't come up with a new formula yet, Senate majority for what they would do around the dividend. Um, the third element is an act of broad-based tax and close loopholes to taxes, as well as some smaller taxes. I have proposed in SB 100 an income tax that would raise 1.4 billion, it's based on your average gross income that you pay to the federal government and is calculated at 5% of the average gross income you pay for the federal government. Under, under uh, our ledge finance is calculated 1.4 billion, but the number could be revised downward by shifting the percentage or through exemptions, but would capture out-of-state income. It's inherently progressive as it reflects the progressivity of the federal tax code. So I've introduced that legislation, I'm waiting for a hearing on it just to kind of get that discussion going. But the other option that the Senate majority is looking at is a sales tax proposal of between two and 3% seasonally adjusted. So it would be 2% and then in uh, tourist season, it would raise to 4% for an average of about 2.8%. And they estimate that that would raise about $400 million. No bills for that have been introduced yet, but the concepts have been described to me by the Senate majority. So mine would be an income tax, but there is a sales tax option. And perhaps my income tax would help make a sales tax option be more feasible because you know they can point to me and go, that's the tax guy, we can give you a better deal. I don't know. But um, I, I still believe that the education uh, tax on the first pay stub with modest progressivity um, could actually generate income. I've proposed a five-step progressivity, zero for those earning less than 30,000, 50 bucks for those earning 30 to 75,000, 100 bucks for those earning 75 to 150,000. 250 bucks for those earning 150 to 250,000, 500 bucks for those earning 250 to 500,000 and 1,000 for anyone above $500,000 in income. That could raise between 50 and $100 million. Uh, raising the motor fuels tax actually is probably gonna pass this year, generally supported by both, by both uh, groups in the Senate, would generate about 40 million. 
Simply closing the S corporation loophole in our tax code would generate between 25 and $60 million. There's bills that have been proposed by uh, Senator Wilikowski to do that. And then I believe we should invest some money. So this is a loss to revenue of about $200 million to capture funds we've left on the table from the federal government for water conservation, Medicaid, and transportation monies. So we have left money on the table that we could have leveraged in by not spending money. And even though that doesn't calculate into my general fund calculations and is a net deficit to the federal, I mean, to the uh, general fund, it's still a calculation we should be considering. Finally, as part of our compromise and getting people on board, I'd support a modest spending cap that's based on a ceiling above the current levels of UGF spending, about 4.5 billion this last year, including the dividend. Um, and that would exclude the capital budget, the dividend expenditure, and that would be inflation index with provisions for emergency appropriations for catastrophic emergencies like a flood, an earthquake, or uh, things of that nature, so that there would be some provisions, but still um, a lower one than the constitutional dividend. Now, just to close this out, I want to say under my low scenario, um, under each of these provisions, and this calculates the loss of royalty revenue, calculates an additional expenditure of 200 million to capture, capture uh, federal revenue. Under my low proposal, it would generate with the POMV about a $4.32 billion budget. It's important to remember that while that is 500 million under today's budget, it doesn't include the 680 million we expended in that $4.5 billion budget for dividend checks. So it's actually above the level of all the rest of the spending outside of the dividend check, which is of course accounted for in the, percent, the uh, dividend constitutional dividend fund. Under the high scenario, if they enacted the income tax fully, uh, for example, um, it would generate uh, it would generate somewhere in the neighborhood, somewhere in the neighborhood of around five billion dollars, five billion dollars. But that is predicated in both cases on anywhere from a five hundred million to a one point four billion dollar income tax. So I. The 500 million or the lower end income tax generates 4.32 billion. The higher end generates 5.61 billion. The Senate's plan, which still includes a dividend, would generate 3.479 billion, including the dividend. If they removed the dividend, that would put them at about 4.1 billion. So in the same ballpark as my low end plan, but they would zero out the dividend. Under my plan, you'd still have a modest dividend calculated in. So that's the um, that's the scoop. That's the plan. I have a lot of other questions that I have uh, uh, that I suspect you will want answers to, but that is it in a nutshell. And I think I did that in about eight minutes, right, Cliff? Um, I think you're good on that. And I appreciate that, Senator Begich. We're now going to go for Red Representative Sponholtz's plan um, of how to uh, fix our um, structural fiscal deficit and save the state. Representative Sponholtz, please take it away. All right, hi. Um, it, it's, uh, it's great to see all of you. And first, I wanna just note that I live and work and represent those that live on Denina land. And right now I'm calling in from Tlingit Ani, which is down in Southeast Alaska. Um, and uh, I'm thrilled to have you here. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, there's a few sort of uh, contextual pieces that I wanna just sort of put out before I go into my plan. One is that, um, you know, we, as you guys know, everybody in common ground is well aware that we've already cut a lot from our budget over the last six years. We've cut about $3.2 billion from our budget uh, since uh, FY13. Our general fund budget, our unrestricted fund, general fund budget is now about four and a half billion down from eight billion at its peak in 2013. We've cut just about every area of our budget except for the Department of Corrections, which has grown. Uh, which I think is a, you know, a poor reflection of our policy priorities as a state. Um, unfortunately, at the same time, uh, our state's oil revenue dropped from seven and a half billion to 1.6. And that's in part because of uh, global oil prices dropping, but it's also in part because of the passage of SB 21. And that has really changed things dramatically. And in, in, in 
uh, we used to have 95% of our revenue used to come in from the oil from oil. And now it's only 25% of our unrestricted revenue for the state of Alaska. That's a very significant change. And one of the biggest fee changes in our state's funding mix was the passage of SB 26 in 2018. Um, and now revenue from the permanent fund makes it the largest percentage of our unrestricted revenue. It's now about 65% of our, of our UGF. And um, you know, that's very, very significant. We are no longer an oil state in the way that we used to. Be, now we are an investment state, and that makes protecting the permanent fund very, very important. Um, you know, we're we're fortunate that we have that permanent fund. It's helping us quite a bit. Um, you know, I'll answer some questions. I think maybe we'll have some questions later on about the size of the budget and impacts um, uh, of uh, of budget cuts over years. I'll take those on uh, when they come in a little bit later. Um, I do also just want to say that. Um, you know, our, our governor hasn't presented a fiscal plan, which I think is, you know, deeply, uh, you know, concerning for somebody who's supposed to be leading our state. And instead of presenting a, a, a true fiscal plan, he's proposing pulling an additional $2 billion from the permanent fund this year, which would, you know, increase our draw there from the sustainable 5% draw up to almost 8% which is not sustainable, which the permanent fund has said is dangerous and really risky. Um, and this is important because uh, now, you know, we, we know that if we get the permanent fund up to 100 billion, $110 billion, we can largely live off of the interest of it, including paying dividends and operating, operating government. But uh, if, we don't, if we don't protect it and we spend down the permanent fund, we'll run into a situation where we'll actually be increasing taxes on future Alaskans and, and or forcing ourselves to do really dangerous cuts. Um, and this is a very serious risk because we've spent 18, about $17 billion out of our savings accounts over the last you know, seven years um, because a lot of folks didn't wanna vote on a fiscal plan. And uh, so we've got $17 billion in the earnings reserve account. We could do the same thing with that earnings reserve account of the permanent fund uh, with a simple majority vote we spent down that $17 billion when it required largely a three quarter vote threshold. The permanent fund earnings reserve can be spent down with a simple majority vote in the House and the Senate. And I think there's a lot of folks that are kind of leaning in that direction of just spending down that permanent fund. And I think that causes some real challenges uh, for our state's fiscal future. And so uh, I think that that's pretty important uh, that those sort of foundational pieces of information are really important. So. My ideal fiscal plan, and I think it's important to sort of note that, you know, Rep Sponholz's fiscal plan is not going to pass in its entirety, just like, you know, Senator Begich's fiscal plan, much as I wish it would pass in entirety won't, but I think it's important that we have these conversations. I support essentially four elements of a fiscal plan. I think that we need to look at modest changes to our oil tax structure. I think Senator Begich has described one measure that would be um, very practical. We need to close the corporate tax loophole that was identified by the purchase of BP assets by Hillcore. Um, there's a couple of bills in both the House and the Senate to do that. We really need to be squeezing as much value out of our oil, which is a finite resource. We are an owner state and our state should get maximum value of those, those precious limited resources. Two, we should pass a progressive income tax. Uh, a pass, uh, there's a, a couple of progressive income taxes that have been introduced. We've got Senator Begich's, uh, and then Representative Hannon has introduced House Bill 9, which would essentially, um, it essentially is the progressive income tax that the House passed, and I proudly voted for in 2017, which would bring in about $600 million in revenue. And I think passing a progressive income tax is a really important part of the overall fiscal plan because it helps to balance out the regressivity of a PFD reduction. And it allows those of us who make a little bit more to contribute a little bit more, just like we do in a family. And I believe that we are an Alaskan family and we should take care of one another. And I think that's a really important element of it. Um, I think that we also need to look at constitutionalize, constitutionally protecting the, the permanent funds POMV and updating the dividend formula. And this is uh, hands down the most difficult element of a fiscal plan because it requires a two thirds vote threshold in each the House and the Senate and then a vote of the people. And if it were easy for us to have solved its problem, we would have done it years ago. 
And in fact, uh, SB 26, when it was originally addressed, included an update of the dividend formula, and we couldn't figure out a way to get to 21 and 11 in that. And so we ended up uh, taking the dividend formula out and just passing the POMV. But I think it's actually also the most important of these fiscal plan elements because, as I mentioned earlier, we can spend down that earnings reserve with simple majority votes. And if we don't constitutionally protect that POMV and ensure that we're not pulling any more out of the permanent fund, then it's sustainable so that the permanent fund will grow. We're essentially, you know, we're eating our seed corn to use a lower 48 uh, uh, analogy. Um, and I, I would welcome anybody to share another, an Alaskan version of that metaphor that might be a little bit better fit because I was born and raised in Alaska and it kind of kills me to use, a, use that metaphor. But I think it's, it's an appropriate one. If we spend down the permanent fund, we're, we're, um, you know, we're causing problems for tomorrow. So um, I think that I support a representative Jonathan Christ Tompkins bill. He's got HJR1, which would constitutionalize the POMV. And we're gonna hear that in the House Ways and Means Committee and we will also add in a PFD um, for a PFD to that uh, constitutional amendment because I believe that the PFD is very important to the state of Alaska. It's very important to Alaskans. Um, uh, I think that also we need to look at what it takes to get a fiscal plan passed. And so the fourth element of a fiscal plan, I think is important to consider is updating our spending cap. And we have a spending cap with two spending caps on the books already. One is we have a constitutional spending cap, which would allow us to spend about $9.8 billion in unrestricted general fund revenue. And given that our budget is four and a half right now, we're not anywhere close to that. We have a statutory spending cap, which would allow us to spend about $5.8 billion. Um, and a statutory spending cap uh, can be, uh, we can break it if we need to. I think that I don't support updating a constitutional, uh, our spending cap in the constitution uh, without taking an updated spending cap for, uh, for a, a, you know, a test drive out into the, you know, a test drive first. We need to make sure that whatever we set in place makes sense. Uh, for example, I've introduced HB 141, which updates the statutory uh, appropriation limit. Um, it would base the budget based on the previous three years. And there's a problem that we identified with that bill, you know, immediately, which is that uh, it would reset our budget artificially low based on all of the COVID money that we're getting from the federal government because it, uh, it excludes federal funding. So now we're starting because of COVID to use COVID related money from uh, the CARES Act, from SIRSA, from the American Rescue Plan to offset general fund spending. And we could end up in a situation where we artificially compress spending down in a way that forces us to have, you know, classroom sizes of 50 around the state of Alaska or to cut back rural public safety or to further cut our university. And I don't support that. Um, there are some provisions of it that I think uh, make some sense. Um, it applies to appropriations uh, that were made for a fiscal year uh, and not just uh, in a fiscal year to prevent gamesmanship, which I think is really important. Um, but I think that, you know, we're going to work through the details of that. But the most important reason that I think a, spend, a spending cap has to be a part of the conversation is that many of our Republican friends are very concerned about passing new revenue and believe that it will just be a, a way of sort of supporting unfettered uh, spending in the state of Alaska and that we'll have growth in, in budgets. Um, and I think that that's a fair concern. And I, I say that as a progressive, uh, which uh, might surprise a lot of people because I believe that when the price of oil was high and we had a lot of money, we spent a lot of money on things that weren't really important. We spent money on things that were important as we were scaling up government to meet the needs of our state. The state of Alaska provides services that we didn't provide in 1973 when I was born here, right? We've got better, you know, we've got better public education, we've got better public safety, we've got better transportation systems, and I think we should protect all of those things. But we also spent a lot of money on boondoggles over the years. And I think that if we had, a, you know, a spending cap that allowed for growth of the budget with population and inflation, but, uh, but constrained it a little bit, I think that that would prevent some of those blips along the way. Um, that said, it's a, it's a starting point of a conversation because I think the most important thing is that we pass a fiscal plan because frankly, I'm a little bit tired of this roller coaster that we've been on, you know, for 
for honestly my entire life. The first time we had major budget gaps was in, you know, was in the late 80s. That was during my high school years when we lost 44,000 people in net, mount, net out migration. Now over the last, uh, the last uh, 50 years, I'm sorry, eight years in the state of Alaska, we've lost about 50,000 people in net out migration because we haven't solved our fiscal problem. And it's time that we do something about it. And I wanna be a pragmatic uh, you know, piece of the discussion. So uh, happy to take any questions as, uh, as we move forward. Here we go. Thank you very much, Representative Spinals. Senator Begich, could you, um... I've asked a question, Representative Sponholtz, about either the, the policy or the politics of, of her proposed fiscal plan, or both. Yeah, I would. I, you know, be, and one of the people that's asked is, what are the chances any of these plans will actually be passed? And that's that's actually the, you know, that's the elephant in the room. And 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 so before I ask the question, I just want to, to kind of lay that out as the premise for the question. We know that by setting out these plans, we're trying to get a dialogue going so we actually end up with at least some kind of plan. But I have parameters, uh, uh, Ivy, in our plan. You know, Part of my caucus is discussions about them, and they don't support all the elements, but we all agree on one thing, which is we're not gonna support the spending cap without a commitment to some of these other things and to see those commitments fulfilled before we, uh, we, we cast our vote. For spending cap because we've been down that road before. So what is your position? If the only piece of the plan that you can get in the house is the spending cap, are you going to be, it's your bill. Are you going to be, are you going to be supporting that if it's the only piece you can get? Nope. Excellent. See, that was easy. <laughs> okay. Because I got the same answer. My answer to that is no. Mine's no too. No, I, oh. I feel I really feel like that the spending cap is a part of is, is a part of the overall deal. If there if there is a way that we can get some of our friends that are more concerned about uh, about growth and passing new taxes to be comfortable with that because we put in place, you know, an updated statutory spending cap. I think that that is a worthy conversation. The, uh, there's one thing that I will say, and that is that I really don't support creating a constitutional spending cap without being really, really clear about what it does. And I think that um, it's a great talking point. It's a great political campaign you know, message. If you are a Republican and you're trying to uh, you know, be sort of a fiscal conservative, but I don't think it's really good policy. And I think that we need to make sure that we're being really thoughtful about our policy. We have a, a, a responsibility for that. And, and I would just then follow up by saying there's, there's no way there is support in either the Senate or the House for a constitutional spending cap. There yep. is no support. My caucus would vote no on that. Um, I certainly would, but there is support, uh, and I think fairly broad-based support for the kind of reasonable statutory spending cap that Senator Sponholtz has proposed or that I've discussed. Thank you. Um, Representative Sponholtz, um, um, please uh, pose a question to Senator Begich about the policy or politics of his proposed plan which I would note had some similarities, as you noted, to your own. <laughs> well, I'm not surprised that Senator Baggage and I would have some similarities in our fiscal, uh, fiscal plan proposals. Um, I think that we share a lot of values uh, in common uh, and a really deep commitment to our state. And so that doesn't surprise me at all. Um, I think, you know, one of the things you mentioned earlier, uh, Tom, was uh, the, that um, that the Senate majority is interested in advancing a sales tax. Um, and uh, and uh, I'm interested in hearing whether or not, you know, uh, whether or not you think it they are in fact serious about advancing a fiscal plan or if they're just interested in having conversations about it um, behind the scenes, because we've been talking about a fiscal plan for a very long time. That's very, very, very good question, uh, Ivy. The the truth of the matter is they, I've seen their spreadsheets and um, I know that they're serious about it. They don't have the support in their own caucus. And so that's what it comes down to. And so they've, I've seen the spreadsheets. I, I think that their efforts, certainly the efforts of Senator Machiki are sincere. Uh, he identifies as we do an oil and gas tax proposal, the broad based tax proposal, a spending cap proposal and a revision of the dividend. Those are the four magic phrases. Um, he doesn't talk about spending cuts. Uh, he calls it the all-in plan. And, um, and I, honestly, 
part of the reason I went ahead and pushed forward with uh, the very uh, substantial SB 100, which is the income tax bill, was to provide some level of um, ability to 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 create you know to create some boundaries around what we would have a tax discussion on, and that's the outside boundary. So yeah. I think they're quite serious. That said, you know I've been waiting to see one of the bills, even one of them introduced, and I haven't seen any of them yet. Um, yeah. That's why I'm introducing the bills every week or every two weeks. I'm putting another one out that underscores uh, my plan. Okay. Um, well, th thanks to each of you. We're going to go to some audience questions, and I'm going to take a question for the audience and broaden it a little bit. Um, it's, it's about LNG, but I want to broaden it because um, a lot of people, I, I give presentations all the time, like I said, about 60 in the last three months and dozens and dozens over the years. And frequently I'm asked about the possibility of some Duzex Machina superhero, some outside change that would, uh, that would relieve us of these difficulties. Um, LNG or and, and commercialization of, of the natural gas uh, deposits on the North Slope generally. Um, uh, a lot more oil production, um, higher um, uh, oil prices. Um, of some other um, industrial development coming in, um, a lot of smoking of marijuana and buying of marijuana. Um, another one uh, uh, I <laughs> keep hearing about is gambling. Um, I'd like each of you, and we'll start with Senator Begich, to discuss whether some outside force, like a superhero wearing, wearing a cape, of any of those would swoop in and uh, make all the dis discussions we've had the last half hour irrelevant futile and pointless. That's as crazy. I will add one last one. A giant Alaska only federal bailout. That's, that Congress was about to say that. Big, no, that no, not COVID relief, just Alaska only giant. No, 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 no. You, you can't get away with that. I was going to say that would be, you know, some miracle like that would be like a pandemic kicking in billions of dollars to the state. Like that's going to happen. No. So really, Cliff, this is what we pray for uh, you know, in Alaska, every seven or eight years when the budget looks like this, we always pray for the bailout. And for whatever reason, God listens and throws something at us. But look, fundamentally, oil and gas is done. This is not the future of the state of Alaska. I made a speech in 18 on um, Valentine's Day in, in 2018, where I talked about that, you know, about this is whale oil. And then it looked like we still had at least an extended length of time before oil and gas petered out. But the truth of the matter is it's rapidly moving in that direction. GM's decision to move to a completely electric uh, force, recent decisions in, uh, in, the, in Europe and in, um, in uh, India and in China to reduce consumption. These, it's the end. So we, we don't have a windfall that we're going to get from. The, and, and I know that there are members of common ground from the oil and gas industry. I'm not saying end the industry. I'm saying it is not the future of Alaska. It is part of the matrix. What we need is we need to diversify. And when I say that, diversify in a way that doesn't produce massive revenue directly. It isn't going to happen. We have no product that's going to do that. What we need to do is ensure that our communities are healthy. Part of that is connecting them to broadband, taking advantage of federal resources to do that. Part of it is ensuring we have a stable budget. We were smart enough to get a roughly right today, 73 billion, including the earnings reserve is what we have in the, in the permanent fund right now. Ivy mentioned 100 to 120 billion is sustainable. That's true. If you add a if you add a substantive income tax to it, it, it actually gets to a place where you actually could do it with 85 billion or $90 billion, you could. And you'd still have an oil and gas industry that you could finely tune. You could do some LNG development to help certain places develop their ability to have cheaper short-term energy. At the same time, do what they're doing in the Northwest Arctic Borough and on Kodiak Island Borough, which is, developing their alternative energy resources. Kodiak Island is 99%, 95%, excuse me, non-dependent on oil and gas today. Northwest Arctic has used battery power, solar and wind to convert their electric utility to a more sustainable price point. You know, these are the things we need to be doing. We should be developing that technology. We got billions in ADA. Instead of building a highway for $35 million, invest that in village development of village solar, wind, 
technology and help their school districts train their kids to use and, and maintain that technology. Those are the, the future answers are gonna be incremental and broad, not uh, you know, praying for the next great superhero to come down and, and cast their spell upon us all. I guess I just mixed my metaphors there, but you get what I'm saying. Um, Ivy, do you disagree with what Senator Begich, or some silence, would you disagree with Senator Begich has just said? Do you, do you perceive that all this discussion of fiscal plans is ridiculous because some, somebody, some outside savior will save us? Do you, could you identify it if that will yeah. exist? So, so I would say hope is not a strategy, right? Um, and we've been we've been hoping and praying for a long time in Alaska that we would have a way to balance the budget that didn't require taking responsibility for our state. Um, but uh, it's not worked for us for a very, very long time. Uh, it is possible that the price of oil could go up. Can we count on it? No. Uh, it is possible that we will get enough. Uh, it's very likely actually we're going to get enough COVID money to sort of, you know, mask the fiscal gap for a couple of years. Um, is it, is it possible that we're gonna get an, a natural gas pipeline that's gonna bring in enough money to offset uh, the fiscal gap? No, it's, it's not economic, that's not possible. I agree uh, with Tom that what we're talking about at this point in time is really more incremental change. And, and um, one of the things I think that, um, that Tom mentioned that I think is really important is the need for diversification. And, and that diversification of revenue sources um, across a few different forms will allow us to be, uh, you know, um, to be resilient, to be resilient in the case uh, that, you know, the eventuality that oil prices drop again or that the market drops. I mean, we saw with the market crash in 2008, 2009, the permanent fund value, you know, plummeted, right? So there's serious there's serious risks of any one, you know, one fiscal measure. So we have to have some diversification. And I really agree that what we're talking about now is sort of long, slow planning. And, and one of the things that we're going to be working on in the House Ways and Means Committee over the interim, we're going to have regular hearings, is we're going to try to look at, you know, reforms that we know can actually save us money by squeezing more value from our resources, just like we want to squeeze more value from our oil. We want to do the same thing with our UGF resources. So we want to, um, you know, save money in healthcare and in Medicaid by helping people to get healthy. The, the cheapest person to provide healthcare for is a dead person. The next cheapest person is a healthy person. So we can do that. We can be looking at ways to reduce the growth in our Department of Corrections budget by actually resolving the underlying problems that get people arrested in the first place, like substance abuse and, you know, providing them health, health uh, you know, mental health uh, supports and reentry programs. There are good things that we can do, but the, the easy solutions are over and hope is not a strategy. It's just time to roll up our sleeves and get the job done. Neither is okay. gambling, by the way. You can't gamble, you oh. gamble with your future. It's not an answer. <laughs> And actually to that point, oh, okay. we will, we do expect a gambling proposal. And I, I'll just say like, I unequivocally do not support a massive expansion of gambling in the state of Alaska, that we have enough challenges in our state. We don't need to introduce more challenges to our state when we're in the middle of a fiscal crisis. There are much more responsible things to do that can bring in revenue that can support uh, tourism and the diversification of our economy. Yeah, I'd bet again. And I would also note that, <laughs> that we're setting aside whatever um, philosophical and moral, moral questions that uh, Mr. Smiles has brought up about gambling. Unless you have a plan to make Nevada and, and Atlantic City vanish, um, I, I don't think that there's the really big revenues that some people can imagine. Well, well just yeah. Donald Trump's done a good job of making uh, Atlantic there, City vanish. So, you know, there, I mean, there, there you go. Um, Senator Begich, I want to ask. A more political question that's been raised in, about your own preferences uh, in the actual political environment that we have. I and mean, I want to ask first Senator Begich and then Representative Smonholtz. It's been asked by a, an audience member. Um, um, both of you expressed the preferences for an income tax. And Senator ben Begich, you've introduced a, a substantial one. Representative Smonholtz, you've come out for, uh, 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 for it. Um, if some people have said, the real choice in the Alaska legislature is between a sales tax and killing the dividend um, in terms of the actual um, uh, power dynamics in the legislature. I, um, whether or not that's precisely correct, 
I, I'd like Senator Begich and the Representative Spenholz to address the questions of uh, how you see whether you would in fact vote for sales tax uh, and uh, as opposed to an income tax and whether and also the political question of whether you think you'll need to make that choice. So I, I've actually had that discussion with both the governor and with uh, the president of the Senate. You know, they both talked to me about various proposals that they have for sales tax, and they know that I've been a, an opponent of sales tax and then I'm a proponent of an income tax. But I told them both, if they actually put a bill forward, which neither of them have, that has substantial exemptions for the poor, that doesn't put a cap on luxuries, you know, so that uh, that if you're buying a $100,000 boat, you're going to pay $100,000 worth of sales tax on it. And if you find a way to, and the third component is to find a way to, to, to not penalize communities that had the guts to vote themselves a sales tax, unlike my own, even though I've supported a sales tax every time it's come on the ballot. So if, if you can find a way to, to ensure those three pieces are met, taking care of those essentials and, and exempting, uh, you know, finding exemption for the essential food and clothing for the, which affects disproportionately the poor, ensuring no cap on luxuries, ensuring some element that protects the will of small communities have already enacted their own taxes, then I will vote for an, I will vote for a sales tax because we got to have broad-based revenue, period. We have to have it. Now, they have all said, both of them have said that that was a reasonable request. I haven't seen a bill. Mr. Spanholtz, what thoughts do you have on this question? Yeah, so, you know, when I consider, you know, when I'm considering different fiscal uh, different revenue measures and I want to understand their fiscal impact. I want to know how they're going to impact working people, poor people, rural Alaskans. Um, and, you know, for a lot of the, you know, reasons that, um, you know, Senator Begich has referenced, I have concerns about a sales tax. Sales taxes are typically structured in a very, very regressive way. And, and um, in addition to some of the problems that he's described, we have this urban rural problem in Alaska, and that is that things cost more in rural Alaska. So there's this really disproportionate impact on rural Alaskans of a sales tax, uh, which is really, really problematic, particularly in economies that are, um, you know, where there's fewer jobs and, and uh, not as many people making high incomes. And so I, I think we have to be really thoughtful about a sales tax. Um, if, an, if a sales tax were uncapped um, and you know, did sort of the other things that Senator Baggage described, I think that I could potentially get to yes, um, but only if it does all of those things and is uncapped, would it be okay? And, and the, reason, the reason it would be better, for, better to do that than I think some other measures like a PFD reduction is, uh, you know, we haven't talked at all about the PFD and the impact of PFD on Alaskans, but the Institute of Taxation and Economic Policy did a really useful um, analysis of different revenue measures on uh, Alaskans by income in 2017. And we're actually gonna have a hearing on it in the House Ways and Means Committee on Saturday. It should be very interesting. Um, and they looked at the economic impact of all the different revenue measures. And uh, the PFD reduction was hands down the single most regressive of the revenue measures that were out there. And that's because it taxes children and retirees and poor people at the same amount that it does wealthy people that live up on Anchorage's hillside. Well, that's a real problem. And when you've got, you know, in my district, I can think there's four trailer parks in my district. And I always think there's this one grandma who is um, fostering her grandchildren in my district and she's retired and she's taking care of children. And when I think about what, you know, cutting or potentially eliminating the PFD does to her family, that's pretty extraordinary. And I, she's always my sort of my moral compass. I always remind myself that I need to make sure that whatever we do isn't going to tax her at the same rate as it does wealthy people up on the hillside. And the only people in the state of Alaska that were better off with a PFD reduction than anything, than, um, than any other measure were people that made $228,000 a year or more. Now that's a real problem, right? Those are the people that are best off with a PFD reduction. So um, I understand a permanent fund dividend formula change needs to be a part of the overall package um, in, because of the size of the revenue. It's difficult to fill the gap and it's a, it's a compromise measure, but I think that it's really challenging. And a sales tax 
while more regressive than an income tax, it is less regressive than a PFD reduction. So if I have to choose between a reduction of, a, you know, further reduction of the PFD and a sales tax, I'm going to go sales tax. But an income tax is always going to be my preference because I think it's more fair. Okay. Um, there's been a, a question about um, a spending cap, which I'll vary a little bit. Um, I'd like each of you to describe in a little more in, in more detail what you think is how spending cap, additional different spending cap than the one we already have in the Constitution would work. Would it allow the agencies to grow with Alaska's needs? And I also want to ask you to each to consider um, uh, what uh, Niels Andreessen, the executive director of the Alaska Municipal League, has said. He has a list of more than $20 billion of infrastructure needs in the state of Alaska that are not being addressed now and says, hey, if you're going to have a spending cap, you should have a spending floor too, and not just a ceiling. I'd like to start with members of Holtz and then go to Senator uh, Baggage. In yeah, terms no, of more I think, detail about how spending cap could work. Yeah, no, I think that's a really great question. And I think the devil is in the details of the spending cap, right? I mean, you want to make sure that the budget can grow. You also want to make sure that you can have a capital budget. You know, uh, our spending cap proposal is not what we've introduced is not going to be the end. Um, it was a, you know, it was sort of a, an opening salvo. We're certainly, we're actually going to introduce a committee substitute. We're working on some, some updates to it. Um, Cause you wanna make sure that you can address your infrastructure needs. I think that um, the Alaska Municipal League has some really great points. We've got, you know, a, we've got over $2 billion in deferred maintenance projects that need to be addressed now. And then there's all sorts of capital projects across the state that we should invest in uh, that we can't do right now because we haven't passed a fiscal plan. Uh, so, you know, would it allow, you know, so as it's drafted right now, it would allow for growth based on population or inflation, whichever is larger um, over a three-year average. That's, a, that's an opening salvo. If people want to make a counter offer, I am happy to hear it. Um, I'm not wedded to this. As I you know, said earlier in response to Senator Begich's you know, question, this is not, um, I, I don't support a spending cap by itself. And I don't support a spending cap that isn't well thought out. And ours is not particularly, you know, it's not particularly well developed at this point in time. It's the beginning of the conversation. And the legislative, I didn't worry too much about it being too perfect right off because the legislative process involves a lot of iterations, right? Um, as you know, uh, Cliff, from your work in the legislature, the bill will change multiple times as it moves through multiple steps along the way. It'll change in each of its committees of referral, and then it'll change on the House floor. And the same thing would happen, you know, in the Senate. So what is introduced now is not anywhere close to the end. And so if people have suggestions, I think that's I think that's welcome. But what I do think is it's I I respect the per, I respect the position that. Um, that some of my colleagues have, that they believe that if we pass new revenue without a spending cap, it will allow for unfettered growth. And I think that that is true. And I think that the seafood processing plant that's now Change Point Church in, in Anchorage is a great example of the kinds of, you know, spending that we did when, you know, the price of oil was high. We spent a lot of money on things that weren't very well thought out. And if we had, instead of spending that money, had put it in the permanent fund, we'd be having different conversation today than we are, right? We would be in a much better fiscal situation if we hadn't blown, you know, billions and billions of dollars over the year on what I characterize as boondoggle projects. Senator Begich, do you have additional thoughts on more precise details on the spending cap and also whether if there's going to be a spending ceiling or there should be a spending floor as well? Well, I supported uh, generally last year the concept that Natasha von Imhoff, Senator von Imhoff proposed, which included indexing based on either population or growth, just like Ivy's uh, bill, set an amount that was above where we are now. So if, if our $4.5 billion budget, we, I would set an amount closer to $5 billion and then index it from that point forward. Uh, I, had, uh, I would want to see 10% set aside of the amount out, it'd be outside. So an equivalent 10% of the uh, the amount of the budget would be for a capital budget for, and that's what Natasha had proposed so that you'd be both paying back the deferred, you know, basically building on the deferred maintenance and building some of the new projects as well. But you'd have a, fi a, a known finite amount to begin addressing this. So that was her 10 year plan for getting to the deferred maintenance. I agreed with that. And uh, those were the, the essential elements of it. You know, like I said earlier, I'd want a provision for emergency appropriations. Um, those were the, the same uh, elements. I, I did get asked the question by somebody privately just to restate my three 
conditions for the um, a sales tax. Once again, they were to ensure that essentials weren't taxed, uh, you know, so that it wouldn't as it significantly impact the poor too. That um, that it would it, it would uh, not have a cap because the rich should have to pay the tax and not get a special favor. So it's you know not favoring them. And then three, uh, the third element was to find ways to accommodate cities that actually tax themselves already with uh, sales tax. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, I um, um, want to, I'm going to wrap up here with two points that we, we can't get to fully. Um, one is, is that Senator Begich has pointed out in the, in the chat, he's answered a question about what happens if we don't have a fiscal plan? Um, I commend that to you. Um, uh, uh, we'll leave that open even as we go to uh, uh, Dick, uh, the, our chair, Dick Malley's closing remarks. Um, in addition, Senator Baggage, I think that uh, David Carter, who didn't get to uh, get to question, will probably. Oh, I did read it. Yeah, I read okay. his. He had a note to uh, uh, Jonathan Christ Tompkin, Tompkins pointing out the false narrative uh, that has been promulgated about the uh, security of elections here. And uh, he had a significant quoting from, um, you know, the briefs that are uh, that have been filed. Sure, and that would be someone outside, although obviously very relevant, a, a worthy topic. Yeah. So yeah, I have looked at that. Okay, so I'm now. I want to thank you very much, and I'm going to lead some virtual applause for Representative Spanholtz and, and uh, Senator Begich for participating in this. Um, I'm just going to say that not every legislator was eager to do this. Um, and I want to thank them both in particular for agreeing to appear um, 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 this evening during the set, uh, session. And I'm going to turn the meeting back right now to our chair, uh, uh, Dick Malleus. And uh, thanks again. Dick. Thank you, Cliff, for uh, putting this together. And a huge thank you to Senator Baggage and Representative Sponholtz for taking the time out of their busy schedules to be with us tonight. Um, to share their ideas and their thoughts. Um, and uh, we hope that the conversations continue in Juno and yield some uh, productive results. Um, again, thank you, Senator Baggage and Representative Spanholtz. Thank you, Cliff. Thank you to Kari Gardy for putting this uh, whole thing together in terms of uh, making sure it runs smoothly and all. And thank you to all of our board members who uh, helped make this meeting possible. And thank you to our members for supporting us and being members and being with us tonight. Uh, we're gonna actually um, end the meeting, but if any folks want to stick around for a little while, we're just gonna leave the um, 